Okay, so we're gonna talk a little bit about pitching and specifically with the focus on fundraising. Uh, a lot of you have pitched before, a lot of you have competed before, some of you have raised funding before. So this is this is assuming um, that you have some experience pitching. Uh, if you haven't, that's fine. I'll still give you some general instructional stuff, but know that you you know there's a lot of practice that that will need to happen. So if you feel overwhelmed, it's fine. Um, if you have any questions about like clarifying that particular slide or that particular topic that I'm talking about right now, um, then feel free to like interrupt, ask questions midstream. If uh, the question is more general, then we'll have some time for follow on Q&A at the end. Okay, so just note those if it's a completely different uh, topic or a tangent. All right, uh, let's see. It is Tuesday and let's get let's get things rolling. So um, I'm guessing that most of you have uh, worked on your slides, have different iterations of your slides. And this is going to be talking about some of the common foibles, missteps, what makes uh, a presentation cliche, uh, the, th the same thing every founder says, and what makes it stand out, right? Because investors operate via power law. So if you go to any VC conference, any kind of investor discussion, they love talking about power law. Can anybody tell me what investors mean by power law? I'm sorry, Abdurrahman, what did you say? Power law? Yes, power law. Investors like to talk about something called power law. You know what that means. That's is it the, the voting power? Is it the voting power? Nope. It's distribution of uh, investment uh, or small pieces investment. If, if you make, for example, thin investment, so that's mean of his investment will make uh, 100x to 100x and remaining three will make uh, one return and remaining yeah. three. Exactly. So spot on. So uh, a specific small percentage of the investments, maybe one or two of them are going to make up the entire uh, fund and the returns, right? So they're looking for that one in a thousand. Like if it's not about uh, like a bell curve, like they're looking for something where one is the real standout and that kind of gives them the returns that they need. So the the reason we're talking about power laws right now is because we know that we need to stand out. We can't sound like every other founder. We can't sound typical. Uh, we need to show that, you know, this is legit, this is authentic, and we are different than any other opportunity that they can invest in. All right. So that's why I'm going to, some of it is going to be opinion. Uh, some of it is going to be what's standard. Uh, and that's why when I, when that, when something is kind of when I, I disagree with the general uh, description of things, I'll tell you, this is my opinion. This is what I like. This is what I don't like. And uh, feel free to kind of uh, see if that fits in with your, uh, with your pr uh, perspective and jibes. So uh, let me share with you guys this. Now, most of you have seen uh, this or something like this. So this is basically a general template of you know what Sequoia recommends a pitch deck should have and the order of slides that they should come up in. Um, and if you look at the one above, that's basically Docsend. So anybody here familiar with Docsend? Do you know what Docsend does? Who is familiar or has used Docsend in the past? Yes, we have you, for we have uh, you that Okay. Yep. Super so, expensive. <laughs> Docsend is expensive. Okay. Uh, regardless of pricing, what does Docsend do? What does it allow you to do? Uh, I think it allows you to track who who's seen your pitch deck, something like this. Yeah. Is that it? How time uh, investors gonna spend per slide? Exactly. So 
if you send a deck through Docsend, you know how much time they spent on your deck, how much time they spent on each slide on your deck. Um, as a result, Docsend uh, has a lot more data than most uh, on you know how investors perceive uh, pitch decks, how they react to it. They have some of the, the more interesting analytics in the space. So that's why I like to uh, check up on their numbers every now and then, just to see if trends have changed, opinions have changed, the flows have changed, tastes have changed. Um, so I'd highly recommend all of you to kind of check out their uh, fund uh, fundraising reports. Um, I'll be referencing some numbers, but I encourage you because they have different ones for pre-seed, for seed, for series A. So highly, uh, highly uh, useful to check on your stage and see what's uh, what's changed on in 2022, 2021, 2020, because not, none of this is uh, stagnant and none of this uh, always stays the same. So it'll give you a good uh, sense. Now, you, you notice if you look at uh, the flow here is, you know, a lot of it is more similar than it is different. So, you know, other than, you know, the three things where they've changed it, most VCs kind of, and, and investors kind of want this to see the same things. Uh, a few particularities uh, are- the, 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 I'm not yet the Excuse me? Is that a question? Uh, go ahead, Abdurrahman, it was by mistake. Okay. Uh, now, uh, and this is fresh data. If we look at the uh, focus areas, now this is how many uh, how exactly. prevalent. So, so having a green building will uh, add six percent. All right, uh, team, you're gonna you're you're gonna struggle with a couple of people with muting. Uh, apologies, guys. So if you look at this, it shows you how frequent these slides come in. So for example, the company purpose slide is on average 1.8. So I'm guessing that when you do have it, if you are some of the one of the uh, 60, uh, sorry, 73 percent of people who have it, uh, then you know it's usually two slides. In some cases, it's one product. Uh, takes a little bit longer. On average, people use five slides, which makes sense if you think of people showing different elements of their UI or your product flow or your customer flow. Uh, team is usually 1.2, so that I guess most people are have their team in one slide, but a couple will maybe do one for the founding team and another for like the overall employees. Uh, uh, so this gives you a sense of how prevalent these things are, right? Now, if you were to look at these, what slides uh, do you like the most? Do you enjoy pitching the most? What slides do you hate pitching the most? What slide makes you feel a little bit uncomfortable? And the good way to tell if you're uncomfortable pitching it is do you go through it super quick just to get to the next slide? So what slide is your favorite? Type it in the chat. Okay, so I see we love product, we product, team slide, uh, we hate financials, eight, and if I am guessing um, eight is either business model, if I'm counting it from this side, or competition. Love competition, hate financials, I... Crystal, I'm not sure if you like market size and financials or if you hate them. Product solution, Liwa is our financial uh, guru. And Khalid says people are looking for reasons not to invest. Yeah, that's cool. Riyadh loves uh, everything except financials. Hate competition, love business model. Okay. Shireen, go ahead. You're muted. Try muting right oh, now. Okay, okay. Yep. Sorry, I've been trying to unmute. I wanted to say, you know, um, in my experience, there's kind of a pitch deck for a particular circumstance. So if you're sending a pitch by email, then it has a lot of text in it and it's written, you know, it's, it's, it's a lot more exposition heavy. You're doing a pitch in person, then you are speaking over, and then if you're doing like a pitch on stage, 
then it's a whole different deck altogether because there's time constraints and this and that. So I guess it the, uh, the my my answer is it just depends on which yeah any which context we're in when we're when we're pitching. Okay, I mean, yeah, you will need different styles. That's why I didn't talk about like how to design the slides yet. But if you were to say communicate it in person, because obviously the, there is no comfort or discomfort when you're emailing the deck. Um, but you know, when you're pitching something in person, when you're asked about it, then you can get a sense for which which ones you kind of love talking about, which kind, which ones you don't. Um, and obviously, finance has come a lot. Uh, come up a lot. Uh, team, not quite so much. So let me show you why I love asking this question. And yeah, financials can include traction, although Liwa, you'd be surprised at how many financial uh, slides we get without much on the traction. Like it just shows you the revenue number. You don't have a sense for how many users are there, how engaged they are. So they just give you like that flat number uh, and it's even worse if it's just projections. So this is how much time investors spend on each of these categories. So even though financials doesn't happen in most slides, so if you see this, that shows you that 60% of the decks have financials. 40% uh, of decks that were able to close around don't have financials. So I'm guessing that the financials aren't in the deck. They're more part of a follow-up conversation and data room that they that they get into the nitty gritty there. So they don't have them as part of their pitch. But when you do have them as part of your pitch, they get a lot of scrutiny. So most time is spent in terms of seconds on financials, then team. And then if we look all the way down to the end right here, what do we see? We see product, we see solution, and therein lies the mismatch. So the slides, the, the titles, the topics that have the most number of slides and where we tend to enjoy spending the most time are actually the ones investors care about the least. And just FYI, to cheer you guys up, this shows you that the average investor spends uh, three and a half minutes on your deck. It's getting worse, not better. So as of 2022, uh, people are down to two minutes and 42 seconds to review each deck. Mohammed, go ahead. You're still muted. Yes, we're we're disabling the unmute button because some people keep on unmuting. Yeah. So now you should be able to. Yeah. Hi. Um, so I'm just talking. Uh, I'm just asking about these numbers here, about number of seconds. Isn't this uh, dependent on the um, the stage of the startup and the context of the startup? Speaking, for example, uh, on uh, let's say a vaccine for COVID uh, since COVID was introduced. So at that point of time, there is no financials and the uh, it's all about the solution, right? Um, are you saying that COVID vaccine was developed by startup? I'm not sure what- No, what no, no I'm, 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 ju I'm just giving an example that if if uh, we are developing um, uh, like a vaccine or something, uh, if we're de developing, uh, let's say, um, uh, any molecule for, for fixing something or like, uh, you know, whatever, something that is more about a uh, hot topic, something about uh, hype, uh, where people think that there will be a great financial potential about it uh, down the road, not now. So the focus okay. will be more into the solution rather than the, uh, the financials. That's A. B, uh, it's about the stage of the company as well. Uh, if, if we're talking about a company that is trying to disrupt certain business model, uh, in a niche area, in a niche uh, business, that is also something um, maybe to consider different than what uh, what we are doing. If we are reintroducing another uh, hair, uh, hair riding uh, service, for example, then yes, I might ask you to show me more financials. But if we are introducing something new, like a, a vaccine for the cancer, then that is something different, right? So obviously, 
different companies will have different uh, focus areas or things that you'd look at. But if we're looking at time it takes to review a deck, um, I wouldn't think it would actually be that that different because ultimately the deck gives you a sense of, do I want to continue talking? It's not a yes or a no. It's, I can tell if I want to continue or I don't want to continue. And we do tend to look and screen through a lot of uh, deep tech decks. And it's not, it doesn't require a lot more time to analyze. It's actually more, it actually takes more time for the areas that are very competitive because you need to do a lot more digging and thinking to see what actually makes them unique because there's so many players in the market. So you're trying to find where this one ends and this one begins. Whereas where there's a core tech, okay, we can you can DD, does this tech exist? Does it work? How, how well progressed is it? But you kind of know the customer very, very quickly and easily. Um, so the purpose of the deck isn't to do the technical DD. Like that's going to be beyond the scope of these kind of two and a half to three minutes. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, also, well, yeah. One one last thing. Uh, also, isn't that dependent on the type of the investors? Meaning, if we are pitching to angels, that is different than VCs. Yeah. Right. So, uh, if you know, we're talking statistics here. So obviously, you might be an outlier. You might have. Higher. This is not exactly how much VCs are going to spend looking at your deck or exactly which are the most important thing. But if you generalize it, mm. there, these are lessons that are important, right? We might all think that we're the exception, but even if you're a technology team, I need to figure out that this is not just a pure tech team, that they can actually run a business, that they don't expect me to babysit them, build their financial model and sell and, and develop the commercial side. So. You might be, I might look at the backgrounds and feel like, okay, these are all pure technical people. Who's actually going to be selling? Do they, do they have desire? Is the CEO willing to do this? Or does he want to raise funding so he can hire a CEO and, and, and offload all this to them? The, it, it raises up a lot more questions, but this gives you a sense of habits and what people look at. So yes, this is not, I, this is not exact, but you know, it is, it is super helpful to understand people's general biases and and their preferences and notice if if you are falling into the entrepreneur bias of talking about what you love to talk about and not taking into account the investors bias of what they actually want to figure out because one of the key things i tell people is you know does this you know is this just because investors are soulless and they're all they care about is money like no but when we look at problem and solution what's common when we talk about these two, right? They're both very subjective, right? It's it's your opinion. This is what you think the problem is. This is how cool you think your solution is, right? Whereas if you look at financials and team, it's, you know, the numbers kind of speak for themselves. It's easy to tell if they're unrealistic or if you fudge them a bit or if they're beyond the benchmarks that you've seen. So it kind of gives you more of a reality check on the team and their ability to actually uh, deliver on this same with team like it's very easy to check if if you've lied on your background your experience what you've done so it, those two kind of give you the credibility so that i can believe everything else uh nimra go ahead okay so one question since we were just looking at data and stats right now uh if we looked at the previous slide for the successful decks we have a lower number relatively for the financials uh slide but we have the most time spent on it. So uh, how are we seeing it in the long term? So if I am not the most comfortable person speaking about financials, is it the best that I skip that slide and we talk and you know, it comes up in a follow-up conversation or it goes up there and because the VCs are ready to spend a lot of time on it, but there's also so, a lot of people you know, who've missed that slide. So the, always the comment I tell people when they ask about financials is, the main takeaway is don't have pass it. <laughs> if you're going to do financials, do them really well, understand them really well, and be ready to kind of discuss numbers with the investor on the spot. If you do, you'll get mad points, mad props, a lot of cred, a lot of respect for knowing your numbers cold. Um, so, you know, if you feel comfortable, if you think it's too much to get into during a pitch that you'd rather have it like as a separate, that's fine. 
like you are allowed to pitch. And, and this is part of why I like to talk about percentages um, because I hate doing templates. Like the more main takeaway of this isn't that I want you all to have a deck and pitch something that follows uh, this format, right? It's more along the lines of, oh, I am, I'm actually able to choose which things I do and don't do. Um, I can lean more on the slides that I think are super relevant. Maybe in your case, you're in a market that people aren't familiar with. Maybe you actually need to spend more time in market size to show them how this market operates because it's something that a lot of people don't understand and you need to actually educate them on the significance of it. So you will need to spend more time there. I don't want you all to kind of follow this as a prescriptive. The whole point of this is that there is a mismatch between what we like to say and what others want to hear. And just acknowledging that and putting more care into how we talk about financials, how we talk about team, how we talk about competition is super important. We'll get more into specifics uh, of how I think, you know, uh, it's better to approach these, uh, some of these topics. And uh, we'll give you, I'll give you some examples there. Uh, Sena, go ahead. Hey, um, actually, my question is regarding the financial. When we talk about the financial, you mean the financial attraction, our revenue uh, and our uh, capital and how we spend it, or do you mean the, uh, the fund that we are planning to raise? So financials aren't usually fundraising. It's not, I am raising this much. That's more of a use of funds and a, and a fundraising slide and ask uh, kind of a, your ask. Financials are going to be more of your revenue, uh, your growth, how much you've made, how much you're you know you're planning to make, your unity economics. So that would kind of fall into the category of financials. Uh, so yeah, yeah. So, so so you mean I have to put both of them the the revenue that I have made and the uh, the fund that I requesting? Because I have seen some budget budget like this. Pitch decks that do what? They are defining the same time. They are uh, they like comparing how much we are we are, are having a revenue and how much we are planning to raise. I mean, if you want, you can. Um, this isn't like a design uh, discussion. If you think you want to fit both of them in one slide, you can. I personally don't like busy slides. I tend to lean towards like each slide has a core message, as I'm going to allude to right now. Um, so to give you like some more up-to-date stuff um, of how people's tastes have changed. So if you look at, this is the order for the decks that have closed, have actually managed to close fundraising, uh, where people have, where investors have actually spent more time. And if you notice, you know, they, they spent a lot more time in team um, they spent a lot more time in uh, kind of so other, they've got a couple of problem, a uh, little bit more time, financials actually less time. So this has changed, right? Mm -hmm. In, uh, in uh, 2022. Then if you look at the unsuccessful decks, the ones that haven't uh, managed to close around. And by the way, here's, I'm gonna be sharing all this with you guys later. This is the order, the sequence, right? And you see the ask uh, kind of go in the end there, after financials, after competition. If you look at unsuccessful decks, uh, this tends to be the most common uh, order that comes in, where there's no time in financials, uh, problem solution. So this this has I actually pulled this um, I pulled this uh, earlier this week. So I was reviewing what the what was the, the latest what changed. And another thing that happened in this year is that most funding went to companies where the product was launched. So 91% of the of the funding went to companies that had a product. So alpha, beta, obviously most went to launch, but no product was a much, much smaller uh, category than uh, prior years. So the, this stuff is changing. But you know these are statistics. I don't want to. I don't want you to get stuck in. We we'll have to follow this order. I have to have this slide. I have to do this. But it's important to use it to check. Am I not covering enough time here? Am I not paying enough attention here? 
That's the main takeaway. And obviously a, uh, a reality check on how much time people actually spend evaluating our deck. Khalid, you had your hand up uh, for a little bit. Yep, me or the other Khalid? Uh, actually, it was other, before me. Khaled, the other Khalid gave up. Were you sick of- Yeah, uh, Khalid, you go. No, he's, he's there. He raised the his line. hand again. Yeah, yeah, I raised my hand again. So thank you. Uh, I want to ask about the order. So should we change the strategy, the problem, uh, solution, product, etc.? And uh, put the financial, then put the team, <laughs> then by the, the answer end. from Abdurrahman's face. <laughs> yeah. Look, so here's the thing that we are actually super stubborn about. We have been asked by many. So some founders ask us for like a template and an order to follow. Some investors say, oh, we'd actually like if all the pitches had the exact same order so I can just easily compare them. And we actively fight against it because I don't want you all to sound the same. You have different strengths and weaknesses and you should not all have the same exact template. I don't want it to sound way too formulaic. All right. So we can, I want to give you the pieces and then we will figure out the best order, right? This gives you a general order to try and see how it feels, but then you can play around with it and see how, what naturally flows one after the other. Yeah, um, I also would like to add, every company has a different narrative. Uh, depending on your stage, your story, there's something you want to highlight, something you want to not touch upon so much. So what might work for you, an order might work for you, might not work for another startup that's pitching right after you. So it very much depends on the narrative that you can create. And each startup can have multiple narratives, by the way. Like you can have multiple successful uh, pitches that follow different narratives, different focuses, depending on are you talking to an invest investor, an angel, or a VC, or an accelerator, or is he, are you at a competition? So it very much depends. Okay, thank you. All right. So sure. um, I'll be sharing uh, the link to the full Docsend thing. I encourage you to look at all the data regarding your stage. So pre-seed, seed, series A, just so you have the most up-to-date stuff. Frequently check this. Uh, by the way, my suggestion, if you're actually uh, fundraising for an A round, would be to throw away all of your seed deck and start from scratch. Don't go to each subsequent thing, assuming that the, the, the deck that works in a seed stage is always going to work perfectly in an A, especially if it, you've, you, you know, you're raising a much larger amount, the company's in a different level, you're talking to a very different kind of VC, would recommend that you kind of start from scratch. I'm not saying that you can't use any of the graphics or images that you have, but it's a much healthier mindset to think of how can I show, like you're no longer pitching a promise, you're pitching performance. This is what we've done. This is what we're, we're the leading company here. We've done this, we've done this, we've done this. Instead of we're going, we're going, and we, you kind of follow that same mental uh, path that you've you've gotten used to when you've pitched your you know your first uh, your first style a uh, hundred or so times. Khalid. Yeah, how are you? Uh, two questions. Uh, number one regarding the financials. When we say uh, the, the financials, and we have only one slide to keep it min uh, minimal, uh, what matters the most? Uh, the forecast, number one, the unit economics, number two, or uh, uh, the traction and the growth in, in, in general? So I would prefer that traction and uh, is like its own slide and financials are kind of its own slide. Some people have a really nice way of showing unit economics alongside traction. If you've done that, great. Uh, personally, I don't care too much about projections. Um, I know some investors do. Uh, I prefer in, in projections sit in an appendix somewhere. I don't know who takes it seriously. And I, I can't imagine the person who makes an investment decision in a company just because it, they see that, oh, in five years, we're gonna have this many millions in revenue. It's like, who, who is that person? I don't know, but you know, I'd like to sell them a bridge if so. Good. The other question, and uh, we're currently in a pre A. So, should I follow the rules of seed or A? We're in in a bridge mode. You're you're not an A, so I it's it's closer to a seed. 
uh, and some even the names. Like if you look at a couple of years ago, uh, pre A was actually called Seed Prime or Seed Plus uh, and Seed Extension. So people keep coming up with names. Um, ultimately, an A round is different because you usually have, you know, it's a sizable round. You have a firm leading it. It's usually not a safe. So there's a convertible uh, conversion that's going to happen. It's a priced round. There's a, it's a VC firm that's taking a board seat. So if those factors come into place, then it's an A and it's a different kind of fundraise. Uh, and you know, usually a much more complex, uh, more data kind of uh, strung along in the deck. Cool. Okay. Thank you. That's why I try. So, guys, you'll notice that there's a lot of names. I try to actually not get too stuck in. Is this an, a precede? A precede? Da, da, da. I tried not to kind of get too hung up because people say it's this number and this number, and it keeps changing. I think it's it's not healthy to kind of obsess over it too much. For me, if somebody says pre-seed, I'm assuming that there isn't much revenue, there's no product. Seed, that there is some product. Um, and A, that this is a sizable round targeting very large uh, investors that, that are going to convert. Matthew, go ahead. Yep. Um, especially for uh, startups, which are on a pre-revenue stage, you have a market size, you have uh, some traction, which you already got. And you make your forecast for the next five years or seven years. Now, of course, uh, the forecasts are based on your solid assumptions. Now, what is the best way to convince an investor on these forecasts? Uh, to not try to convince the investor on the forecast. Because, yeah, yeah. It, it, so what's what persuades somebody first of all like there's three levels that i need to go through i need to understand what you do right you would be surprised at how many don't even clear that bar i need to be excited by it and then i need to believe that you can actually execute on it all right so those are kind of the three mental checks and we need to clear each bar so first you're you're kind of showing, you're, you're helping me understand what the problem is, what you're doing. And if you've done those three things, you're good. It's not about, I must make them believe these projections are real because you shouldn't believe these projections are real. These are assumptions, they're guesses. They're the best thing that we have that we think is achievable, but it's not like your strategy is gonna be looking at these projections and deciding, oh, this channel or that channel, that's gonna be more operational. So I'd, I'd want neither you nor the investor, ideally, are obsessed over projections. Is this big enough? That will be more of a discussion of market size and channels and distribution. Uh, and is the product differentiated enough? That's going to be more product and competition. So it, you have to figure out, in your case, where is the skepticism coming from? What is the Achilles heel? What would your worst critic say, oh, this startup doesn't work because of one, two, or three. What are those one, two, and three? And how can you shore them up? Because some, like somebody said in the chat, they're looking for reason not to invest. So focus on the barriers that, that you know, are in the back of their head, address them ahead of time, because that shows you're different than everybody else, because I need to pick and prod. Like if I'm worried about, oh, the margins in this industry are brutal. There's a lot of competition. You need to show me, oh, actually, operationally, we do this. I know this. We've done this. We've actually achieved this. We outperform the market here. I go, oh, okay, wow, these guys, uh, I was skeptical at first, but they seem to have a handle on this. Thank you. All right. And Abdel Aziz, go ahead. Sorry, I was muted. Yeah, I was just wondering about financial metrics and uh, just the, the focus of investors and VCs on those slides, how important, I mentioned this in chat, but how important do you think it is to kind of build a narrative, particularly if you're kind of, you know, pre-revenue, early growth, seed stage, um, and you're talking about not emphasizing too much on, on forecasting and your financial modeling, how important is it, is it to tie in, you know, conventional unit economics and financial metrics with things like, you know, uh, daily active users, um, user retention, uh, user acquisition, things like that, to kind of build a broader narrative that can then justify, you know, uh, um, a specific valuation or something to that effect. I mean, 
um, valuation is going to be slightly different than the pitch. The pitch is this is worth investing in. Valuation is not going to be solved by your deck, all right? Um, valuation is going to come up with benchmarking. It's going to come up with, uh, you know, what multiples are expected, what the market is experiencing. Because when I decide a valuation, I'm not deciding on uh, this is the right DCF that I should invest at this exact number. I'm looking at, oh, what other opportunities have I seen that I've been able, uh, that, I, that I looked at and considered investing in the past uh, three months, six months or so? What is the general valuation for this kind of Series A company, this kind of pre-A, this kind of seed company at similar levels, similar performance? Because I could choose. I invest here, I invest there. Um, so I wouldn't put like a valuation um, justification as part of the deck. The deck is, this is a great company that you want to be part of. Okay. In terms of building a narrative, that's going to be super important, but we need to do it subtly. Unfortunately, a lot of typical pitch training makes it a bit ham-fisted and artificial, which I'm going to be talking about soon. Mohammed, go ahead. Um, just uh, and just a, a quick question about uh, which slide is uh, is like the most important slide in the uh, uh, on the pitch deck and the one that's usually uh, the hook because if you go back to the um, to the uh, point where you show the percentages uh, the product slide was uh, usually five slides and it was on average on the lower end of uh, where it, the uh, investors spend this time, and it was also the highest uh, in terms of the successful startups. Does that mean it's usually the most tricky slide uh, to usually get? Again, because they're usually, on average, there are five slides. Yeah, I mean, why would I spend a lot of time in your product slide? Like, if I wanna, if I wanna check out the product, I'll go try the product. We'll we'll sit together. We'll do a demo. Uh, I'm not gonna sit like zooming into your screenshots. It's just meant to give me a general sense of the product. It's not one that I need to read and look at. Like, okay, that's how it looks. Oh, interesting flow, interesting design. That's it. So there isn't really much uh, more to do there. Um, and if I want to, if I'm nervous about the tech, I don't believe it works. That's going to be part of the technical DD where we're gonna. It's not gonna come from a from a pitch deck. Um, I'm gonna move a little bit ahead because I want to make sure that I'm able to cover some of the points because I think some of the questions have uh, moved into each specific category. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about team slide. So team slide tends to be one I see founders struggle with. Um, it tends to be, oh, I'm, you know, I'm Muhammad, this is Isa, this is Nasreen, we're best friends and they're awesome. We're all rock stars and over to the next slide. Um, and we, you know, it's just not maybe cultural, maybe it's a habit. Some people just aren't comfortable talking about themselves and don't know how to highlight it. Um, this is a great example of a beautifully done team slide, right? So it's showing you both uh, what the team capacity is right now and where the skills are going to be going in the future. Um, so it's really nice economy of slides, gives you the information in a very delightfully designed way. Not saying you all have to do this, but it just shows you that using a team slide, you can do more than simply say, this is our team, these are the logos of the universities we studied, we studied at, right? So that's a very good use of time. Uh, with team, Either you're trying to show like startup experience, diversity of experience, uh, why you decided to do this, that you're going to stick with it. We're trying to evaluate team relevance and background. So don't tell me your entire life story. And um, if you, let's say you're, you know, your first time founders, uh, your recent graduates, you don't have a Nobel laureate on your team. Uh, what do we talk about? Well, we talk about how our skills are complementary or what drives us, why we're the right team for this. Um, I mean, there was a medical uh, technology team where I think each of the founders had a relative pass away because of the condition that they have approached. It shows you they really care about this. is isn't just uh, money making for them. Uh, Abdullah, go ahead. So, Dahman, so this slide doesn't say anything about the background of the founders. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Very, 
Um, future based, more so future based than the prior, than the past yeah. based. Exactly. The whole point, the reason I'm showing you this slide is you, you don't have to stick within that same bucket, right? These guys have used um, their, their team slide in a very different way, right? Maybe verbally, they can talk about their backgrounds, why they're relevant, but visually they've decided to show you, we actually have the right mix of talent. And there are things that we're actually missing uh, that I, we need to build right now. And we know, we acknowledge, we know where they are. We know what areas we need to build strength in. And that's where it's going, right? So you don't have to always use the standard. This is the three founders smiling faces, uh, or it's their you know, pictures from their high school yearbook uh, from you know, 50 years ago. And one is smiling, the other is sad, and each one, one of them is black and white, one of them is like their social media picture, and then a couple of, you know, oh, I graduated here, I graduated there, I graduated there. Okay, so what, right? What do I do with this information? Not much, right? I'm not telling you you have to do this, I'm just trying to show you different ways of doing it, okay? I try, like, this purpose of these deck is not to be prescriptive. I'm, I, I've, I've had so many times founders copy the thing that I say, and the reason I've designed it this way is I'm trying to not have anybody just copy this verbatim. Is that clear? Yeah. All right. Uh, Emmet, squad you, go ahead. Uh, yes, uh, I have two questions here. Uh, first question about this slide. Uh, is it possible to say why the, this founder of this team uh, with me, what the purpose of uh, the reason behind the existence of each one here is it possible? Second question is: uh, Can can I say can I present that my team needs some sort of development, some sort of training to be eligible for uh, practice some task, something like that? Uh, so your your voice is a little low. I think yeah. the can you first. Hear me? Yeah. So, can you? The second question was: Are you? Are you go? Is it okay to say that my team still needs some training and development in order to do this? Yes. Yes. Is, uh, is it no. I, I. I. I'm not your HR guy. I don't need to know that you intend to train your team. Good luck training them. But I don't care <laughs> that you're going. To train them. Okay. Uh, that's the. What about the first question? The first question: The purpose for each one is it. Uh... Is it acceptable to, to say why the person uh, who will manage product here, why the, why we need developers, why we need uh, product designers, uh, doctors, uh, any, anyone who wants or I present here? You don't need story. to justify, like you don't need to explain to me, oh, we need a marketer to market, we need a salesperson to sell. Like I just need to know why uh, the existing founding team is is unique and special, why, they're, why, why they are get likely to win. Uh, more so than any other startup that I could talk to. Uh, all right. Now I want to wake. Uh, I'm going to be rushing through things because <laughs> I I, I, sell, I indulged in the Q and A a bit a bit too much. Uh, now my next point is one that most of you have been guilty of uh, when I reviewed your slides during the application phase. Uh, it's don't make people figure out the point of the slides that that are information dense. Sometimes we'll just dump a graph, a chart, and like, here you go, you interpret this data. Especially in the, in a, in where I'm reviewing decks or I'm meeting founders back to back to back to back, it's good to just tell me what the point is. The data confirms it, but you need to be very explicit, right? So the point isn't that you just draw me in data. The point is to do two things. It's to be clear and convincing, all right? So clarity is the most important thing. So the way we achieve that, the way to be persuasive is to not have this boring standard title of problem, solution, team. Like you are using the largest font, the headline, the screen real estate to just state the obvious that this is the team slide. Instead, make it more of a statement, right? So, you know, you see here, Statement, and then data that reinforces it. Statement, data that reinforces it. Statement, and then in, data that reinforces it. 
much more persuasive, much easier on the eyes, easier to understand what this data means, what you're trying to tell me through it, instead of expecting me to interpret it. Maybe I might misinterpret it, all right? So generally guide the user, have empathy with the person who's evaluating this and try to like, just give me an opinion. Some of you have done this already, so kudos, but you are the very, very, very minority. Uh, amongst uh, most uh, most decks. All right. Now, I mentioned uh, clear and convincing, uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about clarity. So, this uh, is the part where uh, founders love their buzzwords. AI this, IoT that, machine learning this, blah, blah, blah. Useless. And, and buzzwords are ignorable. Nobody wants to pay attention. Uh, it, they sound like everybody else. So the more you can avoid them, the more clear you'll be, and I'll be able to actually understand what you do. We are an AI pla platform that helps people uh, analyze information, like what people, what information, what do you do? Uh, it's still unclear as to what you're doing. And it's just mind boggling how many people will focus on the buzzwords because that's like their defensive barrier. It's what makes, makes them feel special. They don't want to reduce their startup to uh, we do this, we make this because they feel like it's a small box. Like, no, we are a, a revolutionary product that disrupts blah, blah, blah. All useless, all forgettable. So the reason this graphic is here, so if you look at that little purple cloud there, is because my favorite name for these kinds of words uh, was coined by Seth Godin, who's a marketing guru, uh, and he calls them purple farts. So please don't make purple farts, okay? And let's see. And Crystal, like her eyebrows changed significantly as soon as I said that, but I apologize. <laughs> um, so next, I uh, wanna bring up, so for example, this, like we believe in making people's lives easier. Like, what does that even mean? Like as a startup, you don't have the ability to just, you don't have the luxury of just making things as generic as this. All right, now, uh, a couple of things that I'm going to move through very quick. We believe in uh, when we talk about competing in price. So if any of you have, we are cheaper as one of your core competitive advantages and, and strengths and uniqueness, you need to at least defend it. Okay. So it's always scary to investors if you're the cheapest solution, um, unless you have a unique advantage, a unique efficiency, a unique tech, a unique process that allows you to do something at a price that nobody else can match. Because it shows me that your, you know, your customers aren't there because it's, they like it, they love it, it's the best. If something was to come that's, you know, it's a it's, uh, three real shawarma, if there, somebody else made a two real shawarma, they'd probably go there, right? It's a race at the bottom, not the most attractive thing. I'm not saying it's wrong, but you know, if we were to look at best price, best product, best overall solution, I'll tend to prefer uh, best overall solution so that I make sure that people actually love this and will stick with this and you can actually monetize this really well. But if you have efficiencies that nobody else has, so for example, for these guys, like we, you know, we don't have a showroom. We have full, fewer underutilized salespeople. We have minimal. So this is why we're able to offer a cheaper price. This is why we are the most affordable. It's not just because we're, we're not paying ourselves salaries. It's not just because we're using crappier materials. It's not just because we don't understand our cost structure just yet. Okay. So if that's a big point, make sure to defend it so that, you know, you don't get lumped in with everybody. Uh, now, I want to talk a little bit about revenue. So uh, in some of these uh, 
templates, you'll see the word business model. By that, we mean revenue model. Nobody wants to see your business model canvas. I probably don't need to say this to the majority of you, but in a, invariably, every cohort, there will be three to six teams that show me their business model canvas as part of their pitch deck, and I will <laughs> I will lose my shit. So please, um, no more business model canvases in the deck. It's a discussion tool. It's a ideation tool. It's not a presentation or information to sharing tool. So you're a SaaS. Tell me how much you charge. You're freemium. Tell me what is free, what is emium, what gets people to convert. All right? Those are the two most important things for SaaS and for the freemium ones. Uh, we're going to go, uh, we have a session after this with Mohammed. He's going to talk about metrics. So we'll get a little more in depth into what metrics you can share. And that will also help you guys as you're thinking of what to, what to show in your uh, financial uh, side of the presentation. If you're a marketplace, this is a good example. So you can show all the interactions that happen in your marketplace and the fees that come in. So this is another example from Panjo. Um, we have the listing fee, we have a promotion fee, we have a transaction fee. So you get to see all of the different ways in the customer journey and the supplier journey where they come in. So if you're more of a commission model or a transaction uh, model, this is a nice way to present it. Now here's, here's some of the important points uh, in this one. So we actually get a sense for the average transaction size. So this 15K here, super important. We know the commission and we know the size of this at scale. So we don't think this is something that's not scalable, right? So we get the average food purchase every one to two weeks. And we know where this 1 billion uh, revenue number comes in, right? Why is this important? It's because so many marketplaces forget to tell me what does 20% mean? Is it 20% of uh, 20 bucks? Is it 20% of $5,000? Like it's a huge difference. And here, even though like 1.8 seems like a fairly minor commission, when I see the market size and I see how repeatable this is, I realize, oh, no, this is actually significant. Right? Obviously this is point of sale. So for you FinTechs, this will be easy, but it just basically lets an investor understand like how unicorn -y, uh, are you uh, as you scale, right? Now, uh, a little bit about market size. So in terms of market size, we're looking at a couple of things. Some people like the uh, TAM SIM SOM. So we show the total market, serviceable market, and we show like the positioning there. That's fine. Um, another way to think about market size is it gives us a sense of your priorities. Right. If you just give me a gigantic market size that is actually not your, um, not the actual budget that people will spend it. So let's say, for example, e-commerce. If you help uh, reduce the number of returns, there is this much uh, spent. There is this much products or value of products returned every year. Okay. But that's not a market size. Yes, it's a problem. You're describing the problem, but you're not describing how much e-commerce companies spend on the customer journey and how much this how, how much is spent in this category, right? So it shows me you, you're not quite knowledgeable on where this bucket is coming from. Like if you've sold to e-commerce companies, you'll know which department you're selling into. You'll know which kind of pocket that you're being paid out of, right? So be very careful. It shows uh, somebody who knows what they're talking about and somebody who is kind of still guessing in the early stages. Another way to think about market size is that it shows me your prioritization. So if you look at this one, we are starting with vacation rentals. We are then going to jump over to uh, you know the apartments. And then finally, we want to go over to residential sales, right? Why are we starting with vacation rentals? Because they happen by phone call, by email, it's fragmented, it's the easiest one to get. Good, I understand what market you're choosing. I understand why you're choosing it. And I get a sense for the sequence. We wanna capture this category, then this category, then this category. I can imagine what your focus is, what your growth plan is as a company over the coming few years. 
similar uh, technique, just different category. And the other final thing when we talk about market size is that it's good to have a habit of having your sources and citations up here. Okay. Uh, before I jump into sources and citations, uh, Hajir, go ahead. Uh, hi, I have a very small question. Uh, in the Middle East, it's not really easy to find data. So, uh, uh, yeah, concerning the market size thingy, if the actor that I, I'm on an Arabic based product and it's only targeting Middle East, uh, if I can find an accurate uh, uh, market size number, can I go international or should I just go with the random <laughs> numbers that I So found? Showing me a global number is useless. Like showing me this many billions and trillions are spent globally doesn't give me any indication on how your business is going to fare over the coming uh, few years. So usually not very useful unless you've proven that you are actually able to acquire customers globally, that you are basically competing, then you, you're going to take it, the global competitors into account. Yes, data availability uh, is a lot tougher in MENA, but you, you basically need to do the best approximation you can. Uh, who is spending what? where um, the closest thing you can find. And it kind of leads into this one. So when we when I talk about citations and sources, invariably somebody is gonna come up to you and say, oh, uh, where do you get this number from? Where is it? Uh, I, I don't believe that it's inaccurate. All you have to do is, figure, is show where you got it from, right? So you don't, this isn't supposed to be like a thesis, but here we just see like, okay, we got, this number from here, we got this number from here, we got this number from here, and this is how we calculated it. This is what it's based off of. If anybody challenges you, this is how we did the calculation. This is how we calculate the market size. You know, if you have any data that you can share with us, uh, would love to, uh, would love to get it. Love to hear more, uh, and that's totally reasonable. Nobody can get pissed off because you didn't read all the exact reports and research that they did. Uh, the, the worst thing is if you're like, oh, I think that number was from a newspaper article. I don't know when, I don't know which newspaper, I don't know where, but I'm pretty sure I saw it in Jirida uh, Teliom and like, that's it. That, that's where it, it tends to stumble. Uh, Mohammed, take it. Yeah, um, I, I, I was advised before to put a title of the slide as header. So do you, do you advise the same like, okay, this is a business model. Maybe the next slide this is a big market than the thing. However, I don't, I, for me, if I ask him about my, my opinion, I do recommend it, but I was advised before to put it. So uh, you'll, so you'll hear conflicting advice uh, from me and from others. Ultimately, choose what you think makes sense to you. Um, so uh, I would disagree, but it's, it's your call, your choice, what you think actually works better. Uh, okay. Maybe if, if this is a slide that is being read, people want titles and then they want content. But maybe if it's a slide that's being pitched, uh, it's something that we can debate, but you know, uh, to each yeah. his own. Uh, okay. I'm actually going to power through a couple of slides super quick. Um, let's see, quotations. Yeah, that's covered. Okay, competition. Uh, that tends to, that's a really good one. If any of you, don't have competitors, you're wrong. Uh, I'm not even gonna ask. Uh, so please uh, be very serious about how you present competition. If you actually truly don't have any competition, then you are in very dangerous waters because that shows me nobody thinks that what, you know, what, what this area is, what this problem is, is even remotely interesting or needs to be solved. So in terms of competition, I see a couple of things. Um, some people love a table. And that table has them getting all the green check marks and the other companies get all the red X's. I hate those tables. I always look at the, uh, the one element that they've added just to give themselves an additional green tick. And I, uh, I, I, I tend to focus like, oh, we are the only Arabic UI that begins and with a startup that begins with the letter uh, L. And so that, that's why we're awesome. It's like, okay. Uh, um, so not a big fan of these check marks. Uh, some people love them to death. I personally think that you know they're a bit cringy. 
Uh, some people love the XY. So I know this is super popular, the positioning. Um, every, whenever you present this, uh, you will be here uh, mm -hmm. and your competitors are going to be all the way here. And whenever your competitors present it, they will be here and you will be all the way here. Funny how that turns out, you know, it's always remarkable. Um, if you're able to do this with, and you're intellectually honest about what your X and Y is, uh, and you're, these, this is how the customer sees this, and you can actually prove that you're higher in the quality stage, whatever that quality word means, then you can do this uh, authentically. But if not, mm, uh, you, need to, you need to work on it a little bit. So this is a nice example of a company that's done it slightly bit differently. It looks hideous in the way it's organized. But uh, what I like about this one is um, this, this thing, right? He hasn't mentioned every competitor by name, but he's, they've actually noticed the, uh, hold on, let me get the magnifier here. They've actually gotten the characteristics here. So four companies that are in this bucket, our competitors in this bucket, the smart POS companies, they require uh, expensive hardware. For those that are legacy enterprise, they, this is the problem. For those that are Windows only uh, or legacy SMB, the, there's this problem, there's this problem, there is this problem. So you're not, you're not insulting a specific company, right? Because I don't like insulting the competition. Oh, they're bad, they're greedy, they're overpriced, blah, blah, blah. It's a small ecosystem. It's not a nice look to insult your competition, all right? So talking about the disadvantages of the products from that category, tends to A, uh, show a more comprehensive view of things, uh, saves you time. There's our customer, our competitors come in these kinds of buckets. And finally, um, you know, if, you know, this investor, his cousin is working in that company, you're not just flat out insulting them. So much more uh, efficient. And if, for example, if you, uh, you've got this one from the swivel deck. So something that's a little bit more recent uh that used something similar so the customer mix the geographic scope this is not bad it's not just flat out making like make fun of them but just kind of shows the the different players in the field there's one different approach which is called the butterfly diagram so uh this is when you're cutting cutting across different industries so you've got this is one example that is used so you can sometimes even show uh, fundraising, you can add the fundraising numbers, how much investment is going into these different categories and how the intersection is valuable. You can show, for example, the different market sizes of these different categories and how you kind of fit in the middle. So if you're a company that has never been comfortable showing competition because you're not, you haven't found one that's in exactly similar, but there's different kinds that intersect together, this might be a good way to represent it. So just different ideas. All right. Now, Finally, I want to talk a little bit about ending, uh, which is what I'm supposed to do soon. Uh, a lot of you really suck at your endings. You obsess over what the first word you're going to say is on your presentation. You come up, hello, everybody, my name is this, and we are going to disrupt, blah, blah, blah. And by the end, uh, there you've lost steam. It's like, oh, all right, uh, thank you very much. Uh, it was fun talking to you guys. Uh, happy to uh, address any questions. And you just walk off stage. Uh, end with impact and with oomph. Um, actually have an ending plan. It, you want to be memorable. And that's one of the best ways to kind of be remembered. So what I would suggest here is that there's three kinds of common endings. First is the um, the summary ending. So if you are interested in a company that is growing X, uh, X ox over month, that has a revolutionary product, that is uh, scaling into new categories, uh, please talk to me. And you, you're basically summarizing the top three most exciting things. Uh, I noticed that uh, like if you look at 500 startups, and for those of you that were in 500 startups, you know, feel free to correct me, but I, I've noticed that that tends to be the their style of ending. So it's like the summary, we pick the most thing, the three biggest things, kind of use that to end. Um, so this would be an example of that in a slide format, right? So we're growing, we're preparing, da, 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 and, and that kind of gives them the, 
gives them the uh, the final closing at the right. Because oftentimes, if there's a Q and A, this is the slide that stays up on screen. So it's better to have this than to have a terrible thank you slide, which is just what a waste of time and space, right? Just thank you. Thank you for what? I didn't do anything to you. I didn't give you anything. You don't need to thank me. Instead, use it to, to actually share some very useful information and get people excited. So that's the summary ending. That's one of the three. And the other one is what you would commonly see in TED Talks. So TED Talks tend to try to end where they began. So they might begin describing a problem or a situation. It's like, uh, yeah, as uh, this farmer uh, starves, is unable to feed his family, grow his crops, even though like, he is one of the most important sources of nutrition for his community, right? Why should his kids go hungry uh, while he's feeding ours? So uh, then at the end of it, you kind of go back full circle. And if you've introduced the customer, blah, 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 you can kind of end where you began. And you can get to, you can talk a little bit about uh, about that and why, you know, but, and, you know, with our solution, X uh, farmer won't go hungry again. He'll be as well nourished as we are. He'll get better work done. We'll get more quality produce and we'll all be safer for it. And that's kind of like a full circle, nice ending. Um, so that's more of the TED style. And the final style is just aspirational. It's unrelated to like a beginning story. And it's kind of what you stand for. So, you know, making the world better one, two, two at a time was utilized by a startup in the past that was making like in refugee camps, making these uh, uh, products, uh, souvenirs and other items that they shared in the past. So that's one example of a statement for what you hope to achieve what this company stands for. And, and it's a little bit more of an aspirational one. So each of these works, if you've got a different style, happy to hear it, but please have an ending. Don't do this thank you. Don't do a Q and A uh, slide, like just ending slide with a bang. All right. And now a couple of things that are not, this is mostly what I wanted to talk about in terms of content, right? Um, Obviously, we're going to have a separate, more in-depth sit as we get closer to the showcase uh, on uh, pitching. But this is just to give you guys a heads up and make sure that everybody um, has something that they're working with as they get as we get closer to evaluation. Now, a couple of delivery problems is um, and one that's gotten a lot worse uh, post-COVID is uh, being scripted. So a lot of founders have gotten used to being behind the screen, looking down at their script or looking slightly here and you can see them kind of, you can see their, their eyeballs going left to right, left to right, left to right as they're reading their script or they're looking at the description below the PowerPoint as it's being shared. It results in you more monotone. Uh, if you've remembered, if you've memorized your script in front of a public audience, everybody can tell you're not reacting to people. You're kind of in your head. Uh, what's next? What's next? What's next? It's it, your, your voice becomes very emotionless. During the interviews, we could tell who had like a, who wanted to pitch and like had it, something written out and wanted to read it. And our focus in the interviews was to make sure that you don't get the chance to do that because the whole point was we get to talk to you. If I wanted to, if I wanted to read that, I would have read it. I, I, I'm not in audiobook mode. Like we're here to actually just talk to you, the human being. Okay. So I know some people can pull it off. Maybe if you've worked in television in the past, I personally hate it. Um, we'll figure out, we'll, we'll give you ideas on how to know what you're going to say. I, I believe in writing the script and throwing it away so that you know what you're going to say. You have a sequence for how it flows, but it doesn't sound the same each time, right? I've delivered sessions on pitching hundreds of times, but every time I focus and I get new information and the way I communicate it is a little bit different. It should be the same for you guys. It's natural. It's ingrained. We we make sure that our wording is efficient. Our graphics are efficient. They help reinforce things. They're clear. They're not these buzzwordy things that don't give us clarity. But we make sure that 
we uh, we give ourselves room to to kind of adapt and it feels authentic coming from us. And when we're talking about authenticity, I want to talk a little bit about sound. So a lot of you will have a monotone fixed delivery because either you're on stage, you're nervous, you're memorizing, or you uh, you're here behind the screen, right? And it requires practice to figure out the right tempo. Is this loud? Is this quiet? So it's really helpful to think about like your tempo, the speed and how you operate. Because if we talk at the same pace for the whole time, it becomes more like a math lesson. It's easy for people to go off to sleep because there's no variation, right? When we're reading stories to kids, we naturally elevate and add voices and add excitement. And when there's a problem, uh, we talk a little bit slower. It's a little bit more dramatic. When there's a solution, something's action, we get more excited, we're faster. So do that, <laughs> all right? Investors, kids, it's not too different. So please make sure that you notice how you sound. Uh, finally, body language. Um, I'm not going to talk about crossing your arms and all that or turning your back. I think, you know, we're, we're past that. Uh, what I want to talk about is hands. Uh, on stage and in Zoom, people don't know sometimes, like they walk on stage and they're not sure what to do with these things. Like, what do I do with my hands? Have I always had these? And should they stay down beside me? Or should I just fold them like this? Wait, they told me not to fold them. Um, should I just do this? Wait. Doesn't this look weird? Am I like a robot now? So people get a little bit psyched out uh, by their hands sometimes. Um, now, in person, you can you, your hands are your punctuation, right? You can use the like flowing motions. You can use cutting motions like this and then this and then this. So consider them just your punctuations. Um, in Zoom, we sometimes transform into heads. Like we just have a head. We don't have any hands, and uh, that's it. That's I can only move my mouth and that's all you get to see. Use your hands because most people don't use their hands is why you should, right? It, it gets us more excited. We get to a better feeling of the person that we're communicating to and it feels a lot better, all right? Even when you guys don't see my hands, they're moving. Like even when my head is a little circle, I'm still here gesturing and you can sometimes see the tips because they've gotten used to it so much. It gets people engaged, right? So get comfortable. Use them more, and trust me, it will pay dividends. All right, Noof, go ahead. Yeah, I was just trying to say um, uh, what helped me the most by far uh, was uh, preparation for my TED talk. And it was mainly the focus of using hands because I couldn't believe how much people like actually don't look at your face expressions when you're on stage. They actually care more about the hands and like not pacing around a lot, but still walk like still like changing directions, like just moving the core. It's amazing. I suggest everyone practice for a TED talk and they actually you end you end their talk with three main highlights, as you mentioned. So it helps a lot. Imagine that you're preparing a very short, brief TED talk, like tell a story, you know? Yeah. And the other thing, you can also watch infomercials that are trying to sell you stuff. And it's like, oh, look at this. Isn't this so special? Like, they use their hands so much. And it's so effective when you're selling. It's just, it's something we don't pay attention to, but actually is so important. So pay attention to it. All right. Um, now, uh, for almost out of time so in, we'll just talk we about, are already out of time <laughs> out of time please I'm continue beyond out, I'm beyond out of time so uh practice uh practice with you know people who aren't your parents who aren't your friends and your brothers who aren't uh, who don't know what you're doing so the more you can practice with strangers the better and the best form of practice is to pitch to them and then have them pitch back exactly your company. Okay, I need you to pitch the company now. Notice what periods, what parts of the pitch they struggle with, what parts they're unsure of, what parts they're actually looking at you with like expectations. That, um, what do you do here? And with those kind of begging eyes of like, I'm not sure here, that's the part you're not communicating clearly. So 
get that done as much as possible. Record yourself pitching. Uh, if you're not, if you're the co-founder who isn't pitching, record the other person pitching. They don't like it. They won't want, they don't want to see it. They don't want to hear their voice after it's being recorded. Force them to see it. All right. Nobody likes it. Suck it up. Too bad. All right. Honestly, there's, uh, there's still a lot more to be said, but uh, there's only so much time that we can cover this. So I think we'll, uh, we'll end here uh, and uh, we'll answer maybe two or three more questions before we wrap up. Saeed, go ahead. Yes, it's, it's actually a request. Is it possible, Abdurrahman, to share the slides so we can go over them later on? Not we do share you. all slides and all recording sessions on a Discord. Amazing. The recording session. All right. Hajir, go ahead. Unmute. We can't hear you, Hajar. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, I have a very generic uh, question. It may seem very, very dumb, but I, I love to uh, like hear the answer from different people. Uh, yesterday, we talked about wh what are the red flags that uh, investors consider pre-investment, uh, I mean, after investment. I want to know why I'm speaking to you guys or anyone else. What do you find as a red flag or a turn off or, or, or? What do you think makes investors skeptical when they hear about Yanfa? I'm sorry, I didn't hear. What do you Hello? think makes investors skeptical when they hear about Yanfa? Uh, All right, I think we're losing you, Hajir. Are you there? That is so far. That is an. I am. Hi. Yeah, turn Hello. off your video. Yeah, it's been working well. <laughs> Hello. Hi. Okay. So tell me, what, what do you think okay. makes the investors concerned? Um, so far, so far, we, so far, we fix a lot. And their concern is that they're just not interested in uh, ethics. <laughs> So far, this is our so response. Investors don't mm -hmm. love EdTech or are scared of EdTech. Why? Uh, just like what we talked about yesterday, it's not trendy at the moment. Uh, people sure. are you're, going... you're dodging the question when you say it's not trendy. Like, why is it not trendy? People are focusing on other industries. No. The reason investors are concerned about EdTech is because as a category, it's not always easy to monetize, right? So there's been a lot of founders in EdTech that maybe don't understand what operationally EdTech is like. They don't understand how hard it is to sell in the space. So their concern is ability to monetize, size of the market. And, you know, they tend to kind of say a lot of these are idealistic and don't have a clear path to profitability. So... If you know that that's one of the biases they have against ed tech companies, that they think, you know, uh, there's been a lot of startups that did not succeed because A, they don't know how to monetize, they don't know how to sell. If they're B2B, they have not they have no idea what it's like to sell to schools, uh, scaling across different markets, different requirements. So you, you'll start to understand what they're really thinking and what concerns them and how you can weave that into your narrative. Okay? Okay, so we we'll take two more questions from Saeed and Khalid, and then we'll have to close this. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll make mine very, very quickly. Um, we have a, a business model that we're running with right now, which is a request for proposal. It's an app, people download it, they make a request for any garment making that they uh, want to do. And we have a roadmap uh, towards a marketplace. You know, a marketplace cannot be found overnight. So that's our solution to approach a marketplace. The question is, what's the best way to convey that in a, in a deck uh, when people ask us upfront, uh, straightforward, what's your business model? Is it through a slide, we tell this kind of a story, or we tell them, is this, is this actually very common that people have a roadmap towards um, a bit between sh two shift uh, business models? Well, I mean, I think you're conflating things. Number one, you're still a marketplace. Yeah, you're taking in RFPs, but those RFPs are being delivered by people in your marketplace, correct? So your business model hasn't changed. 
the UI and the scale of customers you want to take on has changed, which is fine. You're doing some things manual now, you will automate in the future, which is great. You have proven demand. Because, you, proven you know, market. if you are not neutral and if you if people think that you have a stake and that's very sticky in family situations. What? Uh, Jul Julian, did you ask a question? Okay, I'm guessing. Only one mistake. So let's continue. Yeah. All right. So I don't think it's a change in business model, but what you can say is, you know, we're at version 0 0.5 right now. We're going launching our full automated platform soon. We've proven customers love the product and are going to be scaling up, kind of out of beta at this date. I think that covers it. Thank you. Khalid Bashusha, go ahead. Where is our King B? I think we lost him actually. Okay, disconnected. All right, we'll take one lucky questioner then. Matthew had, to, had his hand up, go ahead. Okay, um, if you take a balance between the content of the pitch and the way you present, is it 50-50? or it is 30-70, or it is 70-30, if uh, you are an investor? Um, I wouldn't even bother answering that question because your objective isn't to figure out the percentages. Your, your, your objective is to do the best in terms of delivery and the best in terms of content. There have been times when the presenter is very engaged and charming and charismatic. Uh, but there are investors who will say, uh, I mean, they might be captivating, but, you know, they put so little effort into their slides. It shows me that they are not very careful when they execute things. And there are some who will be like, well, the slides were well designed, but I could barely keep focus and I didn't understand what made them, uh, what made them special. So don't obsess over that. Um, there, if if you feel that oh I'm not the most confident, like we have had many people who don't feel confident, who have never pitched in a business context, that with frequent practice can really get to somewhere uh, incredible. So we will get you to uh, a, a, an engaging pitch that everybody can understand, everybody can communicate clearly to uh, their other partners in a firm. Yeah, because right. um, most of the time people spend so much time to develop the pitch and they've spent very little time to practice the speech and you know That's end why up in struggling part of it was content part of it was how to communicate and part of it was some of the problems when we people pitch over zoom and in person that's why it takes a lot of time because there all of these different elements come together and like if i was to sit with you guys over pitching completely and go over every little thing we'd take at least two hours uh, and with that, I think Arwa, we have uh, we have to move on. Yes, we do. Uh, we can talk more about pitching. We can talk more about slides on Discord. That's why there are a lot of channels there. Uh, you can go to general. We can take some of the discussions in there. Uh, and we'll also talk more about it in depth as we come closer to the showcase. As Abdurrahman mentioned, we'll have one-on-ones where we give very specific feedback. If you are pitching right out to investors, you can also have that conversation with your mentor. Uh, so that's more customized to you.